When the writer came in and told you that your son was Jeff Bezos, what was your reaction? He asked me if I knew who Jeff Bezos was. And what did you say? I said, uh, no, the name kind of sounds familiar, but I don't know. It is a dream of every ambitious young man to be able to call up his mother and tell her that she's financially free. For him to speak to his father and explain to him that his days of providing are over and that he can finally put his feet up and enjoy the quiet, refined luxury of early retirement. It is quite another nightmare for a child to ask his parents to give him $250,000 in order to achieve this idyllic dream. And yet, such was the dilemma of a young Jeff Bezos who was forced to walk the tightrope between genius and stupidity and ask his mother and stepfather not for a few months of rent money or help paying for a car payment, but an investment of a quarter of a million dollars. Indeed, Jeff was asking for an investment that, if proved to be foolish, would end not just in financial turmoil, but the breakdown of the entire Bezos family. But if the investment was successful, it would cement the legacy of the Bezos family name in the history books forever and open the doors to a life that can only be dreamed of by the lower 99%. In today's episode, we will take you on the pivotal journey of a newly minted 1% family, birthed from two parents that invested in their child to create the largest e-commerce company the world has ever seen, as we describe. How the Bezos family turned $250,000 into $1.5 one of my jobs as the leader of Amazon is to encourage people to be bold. It's incredibly hard to get people to take bold bets, and you need to encourage that. And a few big successes compensate for dozens and dozens of things that didn't work. Bold bets, AWS, Kindle, Amazon Prime, our third-party seller business, all of those things are examples of bold bets that, that, that did work. With a net worth hovering around $180 billion, Jeff Bezos is not just rich. He's the very pinnacle of what it means to have real generational multidimensional wealth. And the man has set new standards for what is humanly possible, with a true monetary value too vast for the human mind to even begin to comprehend. For instance, it was estimated that in 2023, Bezos made $7.9 million every single hour, or approximately $5,000 every single second. To put it another way, by the time I finish this sentence, Bezos will already be the best part of $20,000, richer than when I began. Naturally, Bezos' bottomless pot of gold largely comes from the evergreen rainbow of his Amazon shares, of which he holds a handy 9.56% stake. Elsewhere, he fully owns the fairly recently developed space exploration startup, Blue Origin. Now, with no IPO released, we can't give you an exact figure of its value. But the company did recently sign a contract with NASA valued worth $3.4 billion, which is just pocket change for Bezos at this point. And with such a high net worth, obviously comes a life of unprecedented luxury, which Bezos has embraced with open arms. The first place to start when looking at the life of luxury Bezos enjoys is, of course, his 470-foot mega yacht, the hallmark of any burgeoning old money club applicant. Equipped with a pool, multiple stories and a helipad, this thing is the ultimate counter-argument to any money-can't-buy happiness argument. And with a price tag of $500 million, it's a luxury that only a man so financially capable as Bezos could even consider purchasing. And when he's not soaking in vitamin D on the top deck of his mega yacht, Bezos is reclining in his personal time machine, a $65 million private jet. Because for a man who earns more than most families' entire net worth in an hour, queuing for boarding with the other mortals just isn't something you do. And on the subject of time, what better way to show off your wealth than by purchasing a $42 million clock in the mountains of Texas. Sure, it's not quite as practical as a Casio. When you're that rich, who cares? But we're not done yet, because we haven't even mentioned the divorce settlement that Mackenzie Scott received when her marriage ended with the business tycoon. When most couples file for divorce, they'd be happy to win the better half of the coin collection or the nice kitchen knives. But when you're divorcing Jeff Bezos, you're getting the best part of $38 billion. In fact, just by divorcing Bezos, Scott has become one of the richest women alive. Furthermore, even Bezos' parents have also been able to indulge in the fruits of their son's labor. 
His mother, Jacqueline, and his stepfather, Mike Bezos, are worth a cool 30 billion US, and it's safe to say that they can win any Proud of My Son contest. This wealth has, as mentioned, stemmed from that initial $250,000 investment that they gave to Jeff, and has since proven to be one of the largest returns on investments anyone has ever seen. In fact, Jacqueline Bezos's story started just above the poverty line, but today she enjoys a life of extravagant spending. In 2019, for instance, Jackie and Mike dropped a casual $34 million on a Miami beach house, fit with six bedrooms, nine bathrooms, and direct ocean access. However, Jackie has never forgotten her roots and helped to found the Bezos Family Foundation, a non-profit organization which helps to fund education in deprived areas. Therefore, when you look at the Bezos family, it looks like they're living the definition of a perfect luxury life. They've got the money, the cars, the fame, and even the ability to give back to those who need it. So by now, you might just be thinking about how this empire of dollar bills ever amassed itself. Well, to understand this, we need to go back, way back, before Bezos was born and before the family ever gave him that pivotal loan. In fact, the story truly begins all the way back in 18th century Scandinavia. So when we were kids, we would spend every summer on our grandfather's ranch in South Texas. Yeah. One of the things that I think we learned to value, the role that resourcefulness, self-reliance yeah, plays. Sure. First of all, we had a very fortunate, lucky childhood. So that's that kind of you know, self-reliance and resourcefulness. Interestingly, Bezos isn't actually the biological surname of the Amazon pioneer. He was originally born Jeffrey Jorgensen to his biological father, John Jorgensen. And Jorgensen is a name derived from Denmark. As you might have heard, Scandinavian names have historically been formed to address an individual's father and almost all end in Sen. For example, let's take the famous actress Scarlett Johansson. Her surname literally means son of Hans. The same is true for Olsen, as in the Olsen twins of Full House and fashion fame, and of course, Jorgensen. Now, the furthest known ancestor of Jeff is one Morten Jorgen Benson, who was born in 1786. At this period of time, the name Jorgen was still a first name, and it wasn't until Jeff's great-great-grandfather was born in 1872 that the surname Jorgensen was adopted, with the exact same name being passed down to the next three sons of Morten Jorgen Benson. The Jeffrey that we know today broke this cycle, being named Jeffrey Preston Jorgensen. Bezos's mother, on the other hand, was born Jacqueline Gies, an Americanized version of the surname Guise, which was brought to England by the French after the Norman Conquest in 1066. Jacqueline and Ted sparked their romantic relationship during their impressionable high school years, residing in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they gelled instantly, forming a tight bond. Indeed, it was a bond so tight that it led to a, shall we say, unexpected pregnancy, when Jackie was just 16 years old while they were likely on a trip in Mexico. Of course, we probably don't even need to mention that in 1960s, Central America, having a child outside wedlock, wasn't exactly encouraged. Factor in their less than stable financial situation. And the idea of a child probably wasn't one that sparked excitement in the couple's eyes. Nevertheless, the couple decided to make the best of a bad situation, getting married in Jackie's parents' house before the birth of their child in 1963. Such a move was made, not necessarily out of infatuation, but more out of a drive to ensure that their child wasn't shunned by the community. Just a few months later, on the 12th of January 1964, Jeffrey Preston Jorgensen was born. However, Jeff only kept his Scandinavian surname for a few years, as the marriage between his mother, Jacqueline, and father, John, quickly broke down after just 17 months. The reasons for this divorce, according to Jackie, were because Ted became a pretty terrible person once their son was born, often staying up late and drinking and completely, you know, forgetting that he had a family to provide for. Bezos has never had a relationship with Ted and didn't even know he was his biological father until 2012, three years before the giver of his Scandinavian roots passed away. The Bezos name was therefore not initially a central part of the multi-billionaire's lineage. In fact, he did not bear the name until the young age of four, when the one constant in his life, his mother Jackie, married another man, one Miguel Bezos. 
Now, Jackie first met Miguel at the Bank of New Mexico, which they were both employees of in the 1960s. Miguel, an immigrant from Cuba, was working part-time to help fund his studies at Albuquerque College, and at the time, Jackie was floating jobs to rebound from her recent divorce. For the two, it was love at first sight, and in 1968, the two were married in Albuquerque. At age four, young Jeff adopted Miguel's surname, Bezos, alongside his mother. Then, after obtaining his degree in engineering, Miguel was then offered a job at Exxon Houston, where the family relocated for the majority of Bezos's childhood. Now the name Bezos itself is tied deep into the history of Mediterranean Europe, coming specifically from the country of Spain. Bezos translates to kiss in modern translation. However, now it is most commonly found in Greek families in the 21st century, which has led many to think that Bezos is of Greek descent after mistaking Miguel for his biological father. However, when we go as far back as the literature has recorded, we can see that this name actually originated in Spain. Therefore, as you can see, Bezos's lineage is one of great variety, stemming from the mountains of Denmark to the sun-kissed plains of Spain, from the throbbing heat of New Mexico to the glistening vineyards of France and medieval England. However, the early life of the Amazon pioneer would soon prove to be as diverse as his deep lineage as well. So I loved physics, and I studied physics and computer science. So I wanted to be a theoretical physicist. That's why I went to Princeton in the first place. And then I realized I was going to be a mediocre theoretical physicist. There were a few people in my classes, like in quantum mechanics and so on, who they could effortlessly do things that were so difficult for me. As we now know, Bezos experienced more family turmoil and upheaval by the age of four than most children do in their entire adolescence. He went through a divorce, changed his name, and moved to a completely different state in the space of just four years. However, once settled in Houston, his life began to take a more linear avenue. From an early age, Bezos displayed signs of genius. And when he was just a toddler, for example, Jeff took it upon himself to dismantle his crib with a screwdriver that he found on the ground, believing himself to be too old for such a childish bed. Then, when he was a little older, Bezos created a home security system for his bedroom, which warned him of anyone entering his room. All the while, Bezos's parents and siblings showed unwavering support for his incredible mind, and they chose to nourish, rather than discourage, the innovative spirit of their eldest child, a motif which later became pivotal in Bezos's future success. Bezos also found motivation by watching his father Miguel work relentlessly to give his family the best life he could afford. His nature showed Bezos from an early age what hard work really meant and idolizing his stepfather. He never failed to put in the extra effort to his academic pursuits. In his free time, he also flipped burgers at McDonald's to earn extra money to invest in his entrepreneurial inventions and pastimes. And with this hard-working nature, coupled with such an academically savvy mind, Bezos passed high school with little effort. He developed a particular fascination with the sciences, and after graduating with honors, he decided to attend Princeton University to study physics, as his idol Stephen Hawking had done before him. However, Bezos soon found himself in a myriad of complex formulas and theories that even his great mind could not comprehend. Virtually as soon as he enrolled in the course, Bezos, with a heavy heart, made the decision to switch his field of study to electronics and computer science. This decision would single-handedly put the young Bezos on a path to unfathomable greatness that even he could not comprehend. But Bezos and computer science were a match made in heaven. Unlike the physics program, everything seemed to click for Bezos, and he stormed through his university career with barely a hiccup. He graduated with the highest honors and Phi Beta Kappa in electrical engineering and computer science in 1986. With such high academic prestige, Bezos was scouted by a plethora of companies come graduation. However, instead of going down a more stable route with a higher paying firm, Bezos chose to devote his career to Fitel, a relatively new fiber optic company. There, Bezos helped to put Fintel on the map by building an original computer network from the ground up, which specialized in international finance. Working on this project seemed to light a new passion in the heart of Jeff, a passion for the dollar bill. And so, in 1988, 
Bezos took yet another career path, working as a project manager at Bankers Trust. During his time at this New York firm, Bezos pioneered a new system for handling investment funds. However, even a job at a company as prestigious as Bankers Trust was not enough to quench Bezos's thirst for greatness. In 1990, he joined D.E. Shaw & Company, again employing his technological savvy to create advanced computer systems. Indeed, Bezos made such an impact at the company that in 1992, he was promoted to vice president. Better yet, at just 28 years of age, he was the youngest to ever fill the position, and by 30, he was the senior vice president of D.E. Shaw & Company, a position that most work decades to achieve. However, even this wasn't enough for the young and hungry Bezos. Despite making decent money and being respected highly in his field, he still felt that he had more potential. The idea of working for someone else and giving his energy to grow another company just didn't sit right with him. So, in his spare time, Bezos began meticulously searching for gaps in the market which he could use his skills to fill. Finally, after an exhaustive search, in 1994, he struck gold. After reading an article which detailed how the World Wide Web was growing by over 2,300% every year, the penny dropped. Bezos figured that if the internet was growing at such a rapid rate, any company which rode the wave of this growth would receive similar returns. So began the quest of planning an e-commerce store, and after researching 20 million of the most popular mail-order items, he found his vessel. Bezos was going to sell books. Our timing was good. Our, our choice of product categories, books, was a very good choice. And we did a lot of analysis on that to pick that category as the first best category for e-commerce online. But there were no guarantees that that was a good category. So that was good luck. Now, Jeff Bezos originally chose books for a few reasons. For one, there were millions upon millions of books to sell, meaning that his company would never be short on assets. And books were one of the most sold items worldwide, meaning that the well of customers would never dry out either. But after choosing his products, Bezos had to come up with a name. Eventually, he stumbled across Amazon, later explaining that the name was fitting because, for one, it started with the first letter of the alphabet, and secondly, it referred to the largest river in the world, which he wanted to emulate by creating the largest e-commerce store in the world. But then came the hard part. To truly be in with a chance of success, Bezos decided he needed to move to Washington due to the state's reduced sales taxes. But to move, he first had to quit his job, a job that provided financial stability, high status, a pension and retirement plans, and one which 99% of the population would do anything to obtain. Yet, as we've seen, Bezos was not an ordinary man, and he believed in his idea with every ounce of his being. So, in 1995, Bezos quit his job and moved to Bellevue, Washington, to start his entrepreneurial voyage. At this point, Bezos had nearly everything to launch the future trillion-dollar empire. The only thing missing? Capital. Despite his high-paying career, Bezos didn't have nearly the kind of money needed to launch a store like Amazon. And instead, he needed investors. You see, for Bezos, the only option was to go to the two people who had been there with him through thick and thin, his mother and stepfather. You can only imagine the amount of pride that Jeff must have swallowed when he met his parents to inform them that he had quit his high-paying job to start a company resting on this relatively unknown entity of the internet, which needed a quarter of a million dollars of funding to even stand a chance of success. Nevertheless, with his vision in mind and faith in his heart, Bezos sat his parents down to explain his idea. During the initial pitch, Bezos detailed his meticulously crafted business plan, one which was so complex that it openly went over the heads of Miguel and Jackie. All the while, Jeff, in an immense show of honesty, emphasized that the chances of success were slim to none, and that there was a 70% likelihood that every investor would lose every penny of their money. However, watching their son's passion blaze through the pitch, Jackie and Miguel knew that Jeffrey was on the cusp of something special. Sure, they didn't quite understand what exactly they would be investing in. They were aware of their son's genius, his relentless motivation, and his hard-working nature. 
They were willing to bet every penny that they had saved on their son so that he could achieve his dreams. And so, at the end of the pitch, Jeff's parents took out the majority of their life savings, investing 250,000 in Amazon, but more importantly, their son, in return for a 6% stake in the company. Bezos proceeded to convince a further 20 individuals to invest in his idea, and after an initial round of funding, he finally had the money to launch, and on the 6th of July 1995, Amazon.com was officially born. You might think that with such a large initial investment, Bezos was able to rent out an office to run his online bookstore. However, the reality was much less glamorous. Initially, Amazon was entirely run from Bezos's garage, and the server took so much power that his wife was unable to plug in a hairdryer. And Bezos took on every business role, from CEO to delivery man, pouring blood, sweat and tears into the early days. Yet, almost instantaneously, Amazon began to take off. Despite zero marketing or publicity efforts, Amazon began to grow exponentially, to the point where Bezos was barely able to keep up with demand. By the first month, Amazon had delivered books to every single state and a further 45 countries worldwide. This trajectory only grew day by day, and within two months, Amazon was making $20,000 a week in sales. Bezos also secured an additional $8 million in funding from Kleiner Perkins Caulfield and Byers in 1995 to help the company scale. However, by 1997, Amazon hadn't actually made any substantial profits. Despite its success, costs were still high, and Bezos was reinvesting every single cent he earned back into the company to help its growth. Nevertheless, in the same year, Bezos made the decision to take Amazon public, with shares starting at just $18. There are lots of advantages to shopping online, but one of the most compelling ones is how much time you can save. The fact that you don't have to drive, park, do all those things that make life complicated when you go shopping in the physical world is a huge advantage of online shopping. And the rest is history. Able to navigate the tricky battlefield of public status, Bezos only guided Amazon to new heights in the following years, ultimately creating a household name that is not just known but loved internationally. As the company grew, Bezos began to sell more and more items beyond books, giving the company a wider scope for sales, revenue and profits. Two years after going public, Amazon was worth tens of billions, selling over 3.5 million items, and redefining the scope of what an e-commerce store was capable of. It was also estimated that Bezos had a personal wealth of the best part of $10 billion at this time. And in 1999, Bezos was also named Time Magazine's Person of the Year due to his revolution of e-commerce. Even more significant milestones were surpassed in the following years. In the fourth quarter of 2001, for instance, Amazon became profitable for the first time, reporting a net positive of $5.1 million. 2006 was another pivotal date for Amazon, as the company launched its first cloud computing service, of which it is now the largest provider in the world. Today, Amazon is loved by a majority of citizens in almost every country it operates in, and it has famously been reported to be America's most trusted institution of sorts, surpassing even the US military in positive feelings ratings among Americans. Gone are the days of waiting four days for your parcel or going outside to buy your items. Instead, Amazon offers every product you could think of, from books to homeware at the push of a button, all delivered to your front door the next day. And thanks to thousands of reviews of every single product, the days of questioning whether the product in question is worth the money are over, as you can simply take someone else's word for it. Yet, it's not just e-commerce that Amazon has taken over, though. The company also dominates the e-book market through Audible, retail shoes through Zappos, and even food itself through Whole Foods. Amazon has arguably made the lives of nearly every user easier. And because of this, it's potentially the most relevant business in the day-to-day -day lives of most people. In fact, as of 2024, Amazon is the fifth largest company worldwide, with a market cap of an eye-watering $1.61 trillion. Yearly revenue exceeds $500 billion, and it's estimated that by the year 2030, the company's market cap will exceed $2.5 trillion. And Bezos's other standalone ventures also have an incredibly wide-reaching effect. 
Blue Origin, for instance, is engaged in a contractual agreement with NASA, and through it, Bezos has further extended his reach into space, literally, thus allowing him to explore and financially benefit from the exponential growth of yet another major industry. With that all said, financial advisors suggest that getting a 10% return on your investments is a pretty good deal. Little do they know that, by putting faith in your family, you might be able to turn $250,000 into a trillion, pocket 30 billion for yourself, and receive a 12 million, yes, 12 million percent return. In the dynamic landscape of Silicon Valley, where fortunes are made and lost faster than a tweet, there's one name that consistently draws a fascinating blend of admiration and controversy, Musk. This family, spearheaded by the richest person in the world, Elon Musk, has become synonymous with trailblazing innovation, sensational business risk, and newsworthy uproar. But the question that tickles the fancy of many is whether the Musks are an old money family, emerging from a centuries-long lineage of power and wealth, or if they're decidedly new money, choosing to buck tradition for a wholly unique approach to success and influence. In today's episode, we'll give you the full unfiltered answer to that question. We'll first take you all the way back to the origins of the surname Musk itself, the wild and controversial lives of Elon's parents and grandparents, and finally dive deep into the personal decisions of the man himself as we give the ultimate verdict on if the Musk family is old money or new money. Now, we certainly have our work cut out for ourselves in this investigation regarding the old money roots, or lack thereof, within the Musk family. Indeed, although all strands of the current Musk family trace their roots back to Europe before the 19th century, the family itself encompasses an extensive cultural background that spans English, Anglo-Canadian, Dutch and Swiss heritages. With that said, let's first begin with discussing the actual surname Musk in order to give us a solid jumping-off point. One commonly held assertion is that the name Musk originates in England, emerging around the time of William the Conqueror and the Norman Conquest of 1066. According to the theory, the old French term mesh, meaning man, was its likely precursor, evolving over time. However, this is not the only belief around the origins of the surname Musk, and some scholars hold that the name is actually of Dutch origin. This is, of course, quite understandable, given the later connections between the Musks and South Africa. Yet, for the purposes of our study, we can already start handing out points on our old money versus new money scoreboard for the Musk family. We'll give one old money point to the Musks for having English lineage, a very common marker in places such as the United States, Canada and South Africa. This is due to the fact that the oft-called founding stock of these countries, at least as far as wealth and influence in the hands of a few at the top, is almost always invariably English if you go back far enough. Furthermore, we'll give an additional old money point to the Musks for likely having a Norman surname, a classic old money signifier. That's because, even today in England, many of the aristocrats who have been in power for almost 1,000 years, such as the Dukes of Westminster, the Grosvenor family and the Dukes of Northumberland, the Percy family, have decidedly Norman French names due to their connection with William the Conqueror and the year 1066. However, the Musk family's story also includes humble beginnings. In Tuddenham, Suffolk, the specific ancestor where the name Musk came from, John Musk, married Marion Edwards in 1791, starting an English lineage characterized by manual labor rather than Norman aristocracy. Indeed, their son, Harry, worked as a farm laborer, emphasizing a more modest background. Therefore, we'll take one old money point off of the scoreboard for the Musk family line in England likely being farm laborers, leaving our total score line at one to nil, with old money leading with one point. Next, when we explore Elon Musk's Dutch ancestry, we encounter his paternal great-grandmother, a descendant of the Dutch Freebergers in South Africa. These early settlers, previously under the Dutch East India Company, became independent farmers. And though the term burger implies a certain level of affluence or the bourgeoisie, their actual financial standing was often ambiguous. These free burgers could often represent the hard-working middle class, such as farmers, balancing self-sufficiency with aspirations for prosperity. 
They commonly engaged in trade, selling produce to the Dutch East India Company and ships, striving for a better economic position. However, a social divide emerged within this group, splitting them into the Cape Dutch and the Boers, each reflecting different socio-economic statuses and education levels. This division paints a complex background for the Musk family, leaving their exact financial standing in historical ambiguity. With that all said, we'll award no points either way since this line is unclear, and keep the old money at one to nil. Now, in the Swiss chapter of the modern Musk family lineage, we must dive into the Haldimann family hailing from the Emmental region in central Switzerland. This idyllic farming area in Canton Bern is renowned for its verdant pastures, traditional farmhouses and the iconic Emmental cheese. You know the kind of cheese that is famed for its large holes and subtly nutty flavour. Furthermore, the Haldimann name, later anglicised to Haldimann, remains a fixture in the Emmental region. Indeed, the Emmental locals, through centuries of diligent labour, transformed the rocky terrain into fertile farmland, which is humorously captured in a Swiss joke about Emmental farmers being so wealthy that even the poor ones wash their own Mercedes. However, despite its bucolic charm and dairy farming prominence, with Emmental cheese dating back to the Middle Ages as a regional economic cornerstone, the Emmental is now considered one of the less affluent areas in the canton of Bern. Thus, regarding the Musk's economic status in this region, it is difficult to classify them as old money, wealthy. As farmers who left Switzerland before much of the Industrial Revolution, it seems unlikely that they belonged to an aristocratic Swiss lineage. However, in 1719, the Swiss Haldimann family emigrated to the United States, rebranding as the Haldimans, and established themselves in Pennsylvania. There, they founded the Haldimann estate, overlooking the Susquehanna River, now known as the Haldimann Mansion, within the Locust Grove estate in Lancaster County. This estate's preservation is overseen by the Haldimann Mansion Preservation Society to this very day. And Elon Musk's mother, May Musk, born May Haldimann in Canada in 1948, notes in her autobiography the family's Swiss to Pennsylvania migration around 1720, aligning with the historical accounts of the Musk family's Swiss origins. And while there's no direct mention in May Musk's autobiography of the Haldeman mansion, its existence at all within the family's American branch history implies a significant old money social indicator, particularly given Pennsylvania's historical association with old money wealth. This connection, through May Musk's maiden name, to a well-established family estate in the United States, reinforces the perception of the Swiss-American Musk family as part of the old money echelon. Therefore, we'll certainly be required to give one extra old money point for having a family estate in the United States in existence to this very day, leaving our current score at plus two for the Musks being old money stock. Furthermore, Almeida Haldeman, a notable figure in the Musk family lineage, and Elon Musk's great-grandmother, earned distinction as Canada's first chiropractor and one of the world's earliest female practitioners in the field. Her journey began around 1904 when her husband was diagnosed with diabetes, an event that led Almeida to pursue an education in chiropractic medicine, a then new healing art, culminating in her degree in 1905. She moved to Saskatchewan, Canada to start her practice, and her son, Joshua Elon Haldeman, illustriously continued her legacy in chiropractic care. Therefore, we'll again have to award at least one more old money point for having not only an ancestor who was the first doctor in any field from one of the world's most advanced economies, Canada. But the fact that ancestor was a woman in a time when women were often not given access to advanced education. That further indicates a distinctly old money lineage for the Musks, leaving us at three points to nil, with the Musks our old money stock taking a strong early lead. Now, Joshua Elon Haldeman, Elon Musk's grandfather and his namesake, practiced in Regina, Canada for over 15 years, significantly contributing to the profession's growth in the country. He played a crucial role in securing the 1943 Chiropractic Act in Saskatchewan and was a founding member of both the province's first board of examiners and its first executive board. He also helped establish the Canadian Chiropractic Association and the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College. And beyond medicine, Joshua was politically engaged. He worked as the research director for Technocracy, incorporated in Canada, 
advocating for a science-based restructuring of society and politics, and during World War II, he chaired the Social Credit Party and unsuccessfully ran for national parliament. In 1950, Joshua moved his family to South Africa, driven by either concerns over Canada's moral state or a desire for adventure. There, the Haldemans became known for their aviation adventures, including a 30,000-mile flight along Africa's coast and into parts of Asia to reach Australia. Joshua also spent nearly a decade searching for the mythical lost city of the Kalahari. However, Joshua's legacy is marred by controversy. He harbored strong anti-Semitic views and supported apartheid in South Africa, and he continued to express these views through writings in pro-apartheid newspapers and a self-published book about global conspiracies. Joshua Haldeman's life ended in a plane crash in 1974, leaving behind a complex and multifaceted legacy. In either case, it is clear that Joshua Haldeman lived a life of many old money markers, being a highly successful and notable doctor, notably engaged in politics and having an old money adventurer lifestyle, all pastimes and interests of the elite. With that said, we'll hand another old money point to the Musks due to the successful, if controversial, life of Joshua Haldeman. Therefore, as it stands, and we dive into the lives of Elon Musk's parents themselves, we have the family at four points to nil in favor of them being old money. However, as we all can probably intuit, how one grows up directly is more influenced by their actual parents more than anything. And so in the next chapter, we may see the new money ethos of the Musk lineage that many people currently connect with the surname due to Elon's antics coming to the fore. Now, May Haldeman Musk, known professionally as May Musk and Elon's mother, was born on the 19th of April, 1948, in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. As we have already highly detailed her parents' background and awarded old money points as needed, we can confidently investigate her life without needing to make any adjustments. Now, May Haldeman was born a twin and one of five siblings, and in 1950, her family moved to Pretoria, South Africa, where she began her modeling career at 15. Musk's career in modeling has spanned over five decades, including recent stints in her 60s and 70s, demonstrating significant adaptability in an industry known for rapidly changing trends. With that said, although May Musk's lineage is fairly old money by most standards, modeling in the middle of the 20th century would likely be actively avoided by old money families at the time, and thus, we should likely remove an old money point from our score, bringing it down to three to nil for old money lineage for the Musks. However, May Musk holds two master's degrees in dietetics and has been active in the nutrition and health sector since the 1980s. An advanced education is definitely an old money trait. Furthermore, her ancestors were some of the most important trailblazers in Canadian history in the health sector, thus, her pivot to modern medicine on top of owning her own business seems right in line with the family business. Therefore, we'll return an old money point to the Musk family, since it seems quite natural that at any social function May could confidently, if she so chooses, say that her family has been in medicine for generations. That leads our score back up to four points for old money and zero points for new money. Meanwhile, Errol Musk, Elon Musk's father, made his mark as an electromechanical engineer with numerous successful ventures in the 1970s and 1980s. His contributions to significant projects, including office buildings, retail complexes, and residential subdivisions in South Africa, propelled him to millionaire status before the age of 30. With this, his career trajectory exemplifies the ethos of self-made success and technical innovation. From the 1990s, Errol Musk diversified into various ventures, including property and technology. However, in that same decade, Errol Musk ran out of money. Elon Musk and his brother agreed to financially support their father and his extended family in South Africa, on the condition that he refrained from doing, quote, bad things. However, according to Elon Musk, Errol did not adhere to this condition. Therefore, we must first give Errol Musk a point for new money innovation in the beginning of his career, building companies around tech and property, and remove an old money point for being, reportedly, unable to sustain his wealth even for his own lifetime. That leaves our total score at three points for the Musks are old money 
and one point for the Musks a new money. Furthermore, a controversial aspect of Errol Musk's past involves his association with an emerald mine in Zambia. This narrative, often debated, started about 40 years ago with his alleged discovery of valuable gemstones in Zambia. However, it is crucial to clarify that most evidence points to the idea Errol Musk never owned an emerald mine. His involvement was more in the realm of importing and cutting raw emeralds in Johannesburg, a venture that eventually collapsed in the 1980s. Additionally, Elon Musk has consistently refuted claims of his family owning an emerald mine, emphasizing his self-made status and his journey through college, which left him with considerable student debt. Since the emerald mine controversy is so blurry, we'll award no points either way and move on. Now, Errol Musk has fathered seven children in total, including Elon, Kimball, Tosca, Alexandra, and Asha Rose Musk. However, what makes this particularly interesting for the purposes of our investigation is his relationship with his stepdaughter, Jana Bezoidenhout, resulting in the birth of two children, further complicating the family structure. Even wilder, Errol married Jana's mother, Heide Bezoidenhout, when Jana was just four years old, and the couple stayed together for 18 years and had two children, who are Jana's half-sisters. Therefore, just to make it clear, Elon Musk's father not only had two children with his own stepdaughter, thus making Elon Musk have two half-siblings who are also both his biological sisters and his stepsisters. But Errol Musk initially met that same stepdaughter and future baby mama when she was just four years old. At this point, we think it's only fair to take not one, but two old money points off of the scoreboard for this level of familial complexity, leaving us with a total score of one point for old money and one point for new money. However, perhaps the most important deciding factor for our discussion today will land on none other than the life of Elon Musk himself, far and away the most notable member of the lineage. Next, let's do a deep dive on his personal decisions and decide if they're old money or new money. Elon Musk spent his formative years in Pretoria, South Africa. Born in 1971, Musk's early education took place at the prestigious Pretoria Boys High School, a public tuition-charging English medium institution with a rich history dating back over 110 years. And this school, known for its rigorous academic standards, played a significant role in shaping Musk's intellectual curiosity and drive for success. Thus, from the very beginning, we'll have to give the Musk family an old money point for going to one of the more prestigious exclusive schools in South Africa, leaving our current scoreboard at two to one with old money taking a slight lead. However, Musk's upbringing was far from the old money stereotype that one might associate with such a prestigious education. His family, while entrepreneurial, ambitious and quite famous due to their adventurous lifestyle and political activities, was not exceptionally wealthy during his formative years. In particular, after the divorce of his parents in 1980, Musk chose to live primarily with his father, which quickly spiraled into a challenging financial situation. May Musk had to work five jobs to support her three children, not a very old money lifestyle for Elon to grow up in by any stretch of the imagination. Additionally, Musk's relationship with his father was complex and fraught with tension, with Elon having described his father as a terrible human being and his upbringing as terrible. Therefore, we'll take down another old money point for Elon's childhood due to experiencing financial hardship and emotional volatility that are uncommon amongst the elite, leaving our score tied at one to one. Despite these hardships, May Musk managed to nurture Elon's interests by providing him with books on science fiction, technological advancement, and philosophy, which further fueled his creativity and ambition. Thus, in the mid-1980s, a young Elon Musk found himself captivated by the burgeoning field of computers and science. And this fascination was not merely a passing interest, but a harbinger of a future that would diverge significantly from more old money paths of wealth accumulation and societal contribution. Musk's early passion for technology was a clear indication of a new money trajectory and career choice, one that would rely on innovation and entrepreneurship rather than inheritance or established business empires. Therefore, we'll give Elon's childhood passions plus one point for new money entrepreneurship, leaving the score at two to one in favor of new money for the Musks. Indeed, the 
new money vibe has mounted quite the comeback. However, Elon Musk's academic journey soon took him to the Ivy League, specifically the University of Pennsylvania, where he completed a double degree in economics and physics. We'll naturally have to give an old money point for attending the Ivy League, which still has quite the class signifiers attached to it, despite recent controversial developments. That leaves our score tied again, a 2-2. Two two. For our final analysis and tiebreaker in the next chapter, we'll have to head toward the actual professional life and decisions of Elon Musk himself. Because it is in his own personal behaviours and public-facing image as the world's richest man that most people in the 21st century interpret the Musk family overall as old money or new money. After graduating from the University of Pennsylvania, Elon Musk embarked on a path of entrepreneurship. Starting off in 1995, he founded Zip2 Corporation with his brother Kimball and friend Gregory Carey. Zip2, an early internet company, provided an online business directory with maps, somewhat similar to the Yellow Pages. Specifically, Musk's idea was to simplify locating and navigating to local businesses for computer users. Although, the company initially struggled to secure financing, but the founder's persistence paid off when Moore Davidow Ventures invested $3 million, gaining majority ownership. Consequently, Zip2 expanded its services to newspapers, creating online directories for subscribers, with the New York Times being an early adopter. And despite being replaced as CEO by Richard Sorkin, Musk remained involved as the executive vice president and chief technology officer. In 1999, Compaq acquired Zip2 for nearly $300 million, earning Musk $22 million from his 7% share, thus setting the stage, financially and professionally, for Musk's future business ventures. Therefore, by coming out of college and not entering a family business, or any tried-and-true old-money professions, rather choosing to follow high-stakes technology innovation and rough-and-tumble entrepreneurship, the recent college graduate Elon Musk most definitely embodied the new money ethos of prioritizing risk and innovation over more traditional old money values. For that, we'll give the Musk family another new money point, leaving our current score at 3-2 to two in favor of the statements, the Musks are new money. Next, in the year 2000, Elon Musk co-founded the now ironically named X.com, then an online payment company later known as PayPal. Musk's focus on security and user experience quickly established PayPal as a leader in online payments, and though subsequently removed from his CEO role, Musk's vision was crucial to PayPal's success. eBay's acquisition of PayPal in 2002 netted Musk a significant sum. The exact amount varies slightly across sources, but it is reported to be over $165 million. Therefore, within five years of graduating from the Ivy League, Elon Musk had become a nine-figure earner, and his wealth was gained not from inherited wealth, nepotism, or even traditional forms of investment, but directly from founding new companies, making shrewd exits on businesses he co-founded, and entering the burgeoning tech sector. For this markedly high-risk, innovation-centered set of decisions, we'll give the Musk family yet another new money point, especially since by then, the professionally non-traditional Elon Musk had made much more money than any of his old money Haldeman ancestors. That leaves our current tally at 4-2 to two in favor of the statement, the Musk family is new money. Musk then founded SpaceX in 2002, aiming to make space travel more affordable, and his involvement in Tesla, a company initially founded by Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarpening in 2003, began in 2004. As an investor and visionary within the company, Musk played an essential role in future product design and leadership at Tesla, transforming the electric car industry with his transformational leadership style, setting high standards and encouraging innovation. Here, we'll add two additional points for his monumentally innovative and non-traditional involvement in both SpaceX and Tesla, two companies that are anything but old money in both their product lines and the actual place within the respective organizations that Musk held. Particularly, his shrewd maneuvering into the top spot of Tesla has come under fire numerous times in reports, leading to an even stronger feeling of new money power player ability emanating from Elon Musk when it comes to gaining power and resources. With that said, 
The Musks have now, surprisingly, taken a strong new money lead in our scoreboard, with the family now standing at six points to two in favor of the statement, the Musks are new money. But Musk's influence extends well beyond Tesla. He has ventured into various innovative fields, reinforcing his status as a new money entrepreneur. He launched Solar City, a leading photovoltaic system installer and battery energy storage supplier. Additionally, he founded Neuralink, focusing on brain-machine interfaces and The Boring Company, a tunnel-boring venture. Furthermore, as we all know by now, in 2022, he added Twitter to his portfolio, acquiring it for $44 billion and taking it private. Musk's tenure at Twitter has been contentious, marked by reinstating former US President Donald Trump, firing the vast majority of the former staff with little explanation and facing backlash for promoting what many say are fringe political theories. Therefore, between his additional non-traditional ventures including Neuralink and his decision to face controversy head-on while helming one of the world's most well-known media brands in Twitter, we shall award the Musks two additional new money points, one point for businesses like Neuralink and one point for very public Twitter controversies, for it's quite clear over the last few years that Elon Musk does not follow the old money whispers adage that many attach to generations long extreme wealth. Therefore, we now stand at a strong lead for the new money ethos of the Musk family, with the score at eight to two. However, certainly decisions around one's love life, parenting style and marriages are a key factor in weighing if someone is old money or new money. Let's dive into Elon Musk's romantic relationships in order to see if we can squeeze some last decisive points in order to get our final tally. And lastly, Musk's personal life has been equally eventful. He married Justine Wilson, a Canadian-born fantasy author, in 2000. The couple faced challenges, including the tragic loss of their first son to sudden infant death syndrome and later divorced in 2008, sharing custody of their five children. After his marriage to Justine Wilson ended in 2008, Musk's romantic life continued to make headlines. He entered a tumultuous relationship with British actress Tallulah Riley, marrying her twice and divorcing her twice. This pattern of multiple marriages could be seen as a new money characteristic, emphasizing personal fulfillment over traditional marital stability. For this, we'll add one point for new money, leaving the score at nine to two. Additionally, Grimes, a Canadian musician and visual artist known for her eclectic and experimental music, met Musk in 2018 after they both made the same pun about artificial intelligence on Twitter. Their relationship has been marked by its share of eccentricities, including the birth of their son, whom they initially named X Sigma A12, a nod to both parents' interests in technology and the unconventional. This unorthodox relationship and child naming practice are both almost decidedly new money. And if anything, these acts are specifically aimed at flouting many old money traditional norms. This surely calls for us to give an additional point in favor of the Musks as being new money, bringing that total to 10. Lastly, Elon Musk's relationship with the now infamous actress Amber Heard deserves a quick note as well. Musk met Amber Heard in 2016 while she was still in her now highly notorious marriage to actor Johnny Depp while working on the film Machete Kills, where Musk made a cameo appearance. Their relationship was intermittent, with the couple citing conflicting schedules as a reason for their breakups. Undoubtedly, dating actresses, especially married ones, is not old money, with the traditionally generations-long wealthy class preferring to date and marry other aristocrats. Thus, we'll remove one old money point for the herd relationship, leaving the score at a shocking 10 to 1 in favor of the statement, the Musks are new money. Therefore, Looking holistically at what we've covered today, we can indeed confidently say on one hand, the Musk family has an old money lineage of sorts. The countries their ancestors originate from, such as Switzerland, England and the Netherlands, all have strong ties to the old money aristocracy found in countries such as the United States, Canada and South Africa. Additionally, they have several illustrious family members, including the first chiropractor in the country of Canada, and one of South Africa's most famous adventurers, on top of even having a family estate still intact in Pennsylvania. Indeed, 
Even the name Musk itself probably has some kind of old money lineage, perhaps even the Norman aristocracy, as we have mentioned. However, if we're talking about Elon Musk's direct nuclear family, his parents, his own childhood and his personal life path, the Musk family is overwhelmingly new money in their ethos. This is a family full of adventurers and entrepreneurs, full of people who try to carve their own paths in life rather than try to follow a generation's old road cut out by their ancestors. Furthermore, these are people who have wildly interesting and dynamic romantic lives. They don't try to follow the subdued, quiet, old money style of child rearing or home life. To that point, when speaking about Elon Musk himself, it is more likely that he proactively tries to go against old money, traditional norms in his decisions, consciously attempting to subvert generationally held assumptions around wealth and push back that the world's richest man has to look, act and think in a certain way in order to be successful. With that said, our final score, as we see it, is 10 points in the favor of the Musk family is new money and one point in the favor of the Musk family is old money. In the heart of the grand headquarters of LVMH, a monthly ritual unfolds as the world's wealthiest man, Bernard Arnault, summons his five children to a family gathering. This is no ordinary home-cooked meal filled with the mundane chatter of what everyone did on the weekend. Instead, within these gilded walls, an enthralling spectacle that rivals the gripping drama of the TV show Succession unfolds. As Arno, the 74-year-old patriarch, navigates the conversation around the table, he seeks strategic counsel from his offspring, scrutinizing their ability to helm a $500 billion luxury empire. The meeting commonly runs a tension-soaked 90 minutes in length, each answer warping into a make-or-break statement that could seal the fate to determine who among Delphine, Antoine, Alexandre, Frédéric and Jean will ascend to control the prestigious mammoth syndicate of Louis Vuitton, Christian Dior, and Tiffany and & Company. You see, this saga of power and legacy is more than a family affair. It's the Arno children's private audition for the crown of LVMH. In today's episode, grab your luxury handbags and latest couture items as we take you on a journey through how the world's richest man will make the biggest decision of his life picking an heir to his massive luxury empire. With a net worth that often hovers between $180 and $220 billion, Bernard Jean Etienne Arnault is not just a player in the luxury goods market, he is the game itself. As the chairman and CEO of LVMH, he oversees a portfolio of 75 prestigious brands, including Louis Vuitton, Christian Dior, and Tiffany & Company. You see, his rapacious swallowing of iconic luxury brands first began in 1989 with his initial takeover of LVMH, but that was just the beginning of his ambitious and strategic expansion. He's continuously grown the company's luxury brand portfolio, solidifying its position as a global leader and his leadership styles legendarily marked by an unerring attention to detail and bold expansion strategies. Indeed, Arnaud is known for his surprise visits to Louis Vuitton stores, directly engaging with employees, thus wielding a hands-on approach that has been crucial in maintaining the high standards and innovation LVMH is known for. Furthermore, his forward thinking is evident in his succession planning, with a proposed reorganization to distribute equal stakes of his holding company, Agache, among his five children, all of whom are in executive roles at LVMH. Even better, Arno's lifestyle mirrors the luxury he peddles. His real estate includes five homes in Beverly Hills, totaling $125 million and a $22 million property in East Hampton, New York. And his Paris mansion is a gallery in itself, housing works by everyone from Jean-Michel Basquiat to Damien Hirst. But his love for the arts extends beyond personal collection. Arno's array includes rare pieces by Picasso and Warhol, and he often collaborates with artists for his brands. Yet, beyond luxury and art, Arnaud's influence additionally stretches into political realms. He maintains a close connection to French heads of state, and his philanthropy is well known throughout his homeland. For instance, 
A globally recognized philanthropic move he made recently was his 200 million euro donation to the Notre Dame Cathedral restoration in 2019, a contribution that led French tycoons to collectively donate 300 million euros in total for the cathedral's restoration. Indeed, this $500 billion man waltzes through the wild world of social influence with an ease that's almost unheard of in modern history, which begs the question, what makes a man with the weight of $500 billion on his mind at all times move with such effortless finesse through the volatile world of luxury? In order to find our answer, we'll have to go back to where it all began, under the industrial grey skies of 20th century northern France. In the early 1900s, northern France was a region where smokestacks painted the sky a relentless shade of grey, the rhythmic clank of machinery peppered the air, and streets were alive with the hustle of hardy souls. It is here, amidst this hive of industry and determination, that the roots of the Arnaud family, now synonymous with luxury and grandeur, are firmly planted. Now, the Arnolds, even back then, not ones to shy away from a challenge, delved into the manufacturing industry with a vigor that was as palpable as the steam and soot of the factories that dotted the landscape. It was in Roubaix, a city that stood as a proud beacon of France's industrial prowess, where a child would be born who would paint the Arnaud family's masterpieces. However, Bernard's father, Jean Arnaud, would soon ironically decide to play with bricks and mortar, instead of brush and canvas, by creating a construction company long before his son Bernard made his grand entrance on the 5th of March 1949. Indeed, as we shall see, baby Bernard was not just another fortunate heir born with a silver spoon. From the start, he was a prodigy in the making. You see, his father, a shrewd businessman himself, instilled in young Bernard the intricacies of the business realm, setting the stage for his son's eventual dominance in the luxury goods market. Most assuredly, young Bernard's journey was not just a familial path he walked. As soon as he could, it quickly morphed into a runway he sauntered across. And at the École Polytechnique in Paris, from 1969 to 1971, he wasn't merely a student, he was a sponge, absorbing the nectar of knowledge, especially in engineering, science and technology. Already, here at one of France's leading engineering schools, was a young man sharpening his tools, preparing for a future where he would not just participate in the business world, he would revolutionize it. Upon his graduation in 1971, Bernard would quickly join the ranks of his father's construction company, Ferret Savinel. He was put in charge of 100 employees and quickly attempted to cut out his own vision within the family business under his father. But here's the twist. Young Arnaud wasn't content with just being a part of the family law. He wanted to rewrite and expand it. Thus, in 1974, in a move that would have left Machiavelli nodding in approval, Bernard Arnault masterfully convinced his father to swap the rugged terrain of construction for the more lucrative vistas of real estate by giving birth to Ferinel, a company with a keen focus on holiday accommodations. Like a chess grandmaster, Arnold orchestrated the sale of the company's industrial construction arm, pivoting firmly towards real estate, where he deftly expanded their empire. Come 1981, with the French Socialist Party seizing the reins of power, Arnaud, ever the strategist, whisked his family off to the US. There, over three years, he continued to weave his magic, growing Ferret Savinel's property portfolio. Yet 1984 marked a dramatic turn in Arnaud's saga. Leaving behind the world of Ferret Savinel, he embarked on an audacious journey into the realm of luxury goods. In a bold, calculated move, and with the support of Antoine Bernheim of Lazare Frères and Company, he amassed a cool $80 million. But this war chest wasn't for a cautious foray. It was for a grand, theatrical plunge into the opulent waters of the luxury sector. His target? The then bankrupt French textile giant Boussac saint frère the proud owner of none other than Christian Dior. Therefore, this wasn't just a business maneuver, it was a statement. It was a declaration of Arnaud's arrival on the luxury scene, setting the stage for a new era of elegance and extravagance. In 1984, Bernard Arnaud found himself at the helm of the parent company of Christian Dior, marking the beginning of a pivotal chapter in his career and the luxury fashion industry. And indeed, his initial move was strategic and transformative. 
he quickly dove into a rigorous process of corporate rejuvenation, a task that demanded both surgical precision and a visionary's foresight. You see, Arno's approach was twofold. First, he streamlined operations with a keen eye for efficiency and effectiveness. He did this by meticulously identifying and shed non-essential assets, a process that involved trimming down the conglomerate to its most profitable and promising elements. This proved to be a move that not only improved the financial health of the company, but also allowed for a more focused and coherent brand strategy. Simultaneously, Arno nurtured the core luxury brands, particularly Christian Dior. He recognized the inherent value and potential of Dior and set about reinforcing its position in the luxury market. This involved investing in high quality materials, refining the design and production processes and ensuring that every Dior product exemplified the pinnacle of craftsmanship and style. Furthermore, Arnaud focused on expanding the global footprint of Christian Dior. He strategically opened new boutiques in key luxury markets, enhancing the brand's visibility and accessibility. These stores were not just retail spaces, but embodiments of the Dior experience, designed to immerse customers in the elegance and sophistication of the brand. Thus, his relentless focus on resurrecting Christian Dior laid the foundation for what was to become a luxury powerhouse. Under his stewardship, Dior not only regained its lost glory, but also started setting new benchmarks in the luxury fashion industry. But Arnaud's ambitions extended far beyond a single brand he was building an empire, and 1987 marked a pivotal year in this venture. In a move that would redefine the luxury goods sector, Arnaud orchestrated the merger of Louis Vuitton with Moet Hennessy. This wasn't merely a merger, it was truly the birth of a luxury goods empire, with Arnaud firmly at its helm as chairman and CEO. Soon thereafter, Arnaud, envisioning a conglomerate of high-end brands, faced initial skepticism. Yet, with his by then already legendary strategic acumen, he transformed this vision into a triumphant reality, amassing over 70 luxury brands under the LVMH banner. Next, by the mid-1990s, Arnold's ambitions had taken another tangible form in New York. His goal of cementing LVMH's presence in the United States culminated in the majestic LVMH Tower, unveiled in December 1999, and this architectural marvel stood as a symbol of his bold strategic foresight. And during this transformative era, Arnold's approach to mergers and acquisitions was a masterclass in corporate expansion. Under his guidance, LVMH's value surged by over 1,000% and profits increased by 500%. Furthermore, the mid-90s saw LVMH expanding its empire into new territories like Asia with countries like China and South Korea eagerly embracing their luxury offerings. This led to a period that wasn't just about growth, it was about crafting an image and persona that epitomized luxury and success. LVMH set trends and became trendsetters, with campaigns like Louis Vuitton's 1997 Centennial Collection capturing not just eyes, but hearts worldwide. Indeed, by the turn of the millennium, LVMH had firmly established itself as the largest luxury products company in the world, a financial icon of Arnold's visionary leadership and the relentless pursuit of excellence. And yet, all the while, Bernard Arno was thinking two or three decades ahead, wondering who he would have to pass the baton to when it was time to ride into the sunset. In the next chapter, we'll get a chance to meet his partner in crime when building that soon-to-be legendary succession plan. Bernard Arnault and Hélène Mercier, a Canadian pianist of considerable renown, first crossed paths at a dinner party in the fall of 1989, a meeting that turned out to be a prelude in a remarkable journey intertwining culture, music and high-stakes business. You see, Mercier, a Montreal native born in February 1960, had been a piano prodigy since the tender age of six, and her talent was not just a fleeting whisper. It was a resounding roar that earned her accolades at the Quebec and Canadian music competitions and the Prague International Chamber Music Competition. The romance between Arnaud and Mercier blossomed rapidly, leading to their marriage in 1991, and this union was not just a merger of hearts, but a fusion of cultural depth and business savvy. Specifically, Mercier's entrance into Arnaud's life brought a melodious balance to his entrepreneurial rhythm. She embraced the role of stepmother to his children from a previous marriage, and together, 
the couple expanded their family with three more children, Alexandre, Frédéric, and Jean. Now, by the early 2000s, Bernard Arnault's net worth had skyrocketed, catapulting him towards the zenith of global wealth. And it was around this time that Arnault's deep-seated passion for art and culture became prominently visible. He founded the Louis Vuitton Foundation in 2006, a French art museum and cultural center backed by LVMH. The foundation's building, a monument to deconstructivist architecture designed by Frank Gehry, that same year, marking a new chapter in Arnaud's cultural endeavors. But Arnaud's love for art wasn't confined to institutional walls. He emerged as a distinguished art collector, acquiring masterpieces from Picasso, Warhol, Yves Klein, and Henry Moore. His collection, likely worth an unspeakable sum, was a vivid reflection of his personal investment in the arts. Concurrently, Arnaud steered LVMH through a strategic expansion in the early part of the 2000s decade, and his acquisition spree broadened LVMH's luxury fashion portfolio significantly. In 2001, Arnaud led LVMH to acquire Fendi, an Italian fashion giant, a move that was a crucial step in enhancing LVMH's luxury fashion footprint. Initially, LVMH had bought a stake in Fendi, along with Prada in 2000, but by November 2001, LVMH had emerged as the majority stakeholder, buying out Prada's share. Next, in 2004, Bernard Arnault turned his gaze towards the realms of watches and jewellery. Observing a notable absence in these luxurious arenas, he deftly steered LVMH to acquire Swiss watchmaking jewel, Tag Heuer, for a cool $502 million. This shrewd move catapulted LVMH into the high-stakes game of luxury watches, promising to propel Tag Heuer into uncharted territories. Similarly, 2011 heralded the acquisition of Italian luxury titan Bulgari, further cementing LVMH's dominance in the high-end jewellery sphere. Arnold's knack for fostering growth and synergy was unmistakable, and 2013 witnessed a fusion of luxury and art, epitomized by the Louis Vuitton and Jeff Koons collaboration. Arnold's penchant for marrying the art world with luxury fashion underscored the role of LVMH as a trailblazer in the luxury industry. And 2017 was a banner year for the wolf in Kashmir, with a whopping 42. billion euros in revenue. However, as the registers raked in more dough, the clocks raked in less time, the decades were passing, and Bernard Arnold had still not picked a clear successor for his now 14-figure empire. As it stands today, no one individual child has been named as the clear heir to the throne, but we have a few secret ideas on who will get the crown. Let's investigate that answer in the final chapter of this saga. In the captivating saga of likely heirs to the $500 billion Arnaud family empire, Delphine Arnaud emerges as a central figure. The firstborn of Bernard Arnault in 1975 on the outskirts of Paris, Delphine's childhood unfolded partly in the diverse landscape of New York, an experience that, rich with cultural contrasts, honed her fluency not just in French, but also in the dynamic language of English, equipping her for future global ventures. Fast forward to her education, a blend of French savoir-faire and British economic acumen, thanks to EDHEC Business School and the London School of Economics. 1997 sees her donning the graduation cap, and soon thereafter, she cuts her professional teeth at the legendary McKinsey Consulting in Paris, sharpening strategic prowess. Now, the year 2000 proved a pivotal moment as Delphine stepped into the family empire. Starting at John Galliano, she swiftly ascended to Dior's commercial directorship in 2001, and by 2008, she was Dior's deputy managing director a position that witnessed a surge in leather goods and accessories under her watch. 2013 ushers in a new chapter as Delphine becomes executive vice president of Louis Vuitton. Here, she skillfully navigates the brand through luxury market shoals. Her managerial style is as smooth as the finest silk, fostering a haven for creative minds. Fast forward to 2023 and she's the CEO of Christian Dior, a role as significant as it is historic within the Arnold dynasty. Yet despite her impressive resume, Bernard Arnault plays coy about naming a successor. Delphine, with her growing influence in LVMH and leadership finesse, remains a front-runner in this high-stakes Game of Thrones. But you can never be sure. 
Now let's shift the spotlight to Antoine Arnaud, born in Roubaix. His tale begins in the United States, where he, alongside Delphine, also embraces the cultural melting pot of New York. His academic pursuit takes him from HEC Montreal to INSEAD, molding a business savant. Antoine's odyssey in the professional realm starts with an internet venture, before he joins Louis Vuitton in 2002. Here, his marketing prowess comes to the fore, particularly during his tenure as head of marketing. Then 2012 marks his ascension as the captain of Berluti, steering it to fiscal heights, followed by chairing the opulent Loro Piana in 2013. His role as the head of communication and image for LVMH in 2018 reflects not just a job title, but a strategic move in bolstering LVMH's digital frontier. Speculation about him succeeding the LVMH empire runs rampant, especially as Bernard Arnault subtly alters the company's leadership age threshold. And then there's Alexandre Arnault, born in 1992, embodying the youthful vigor of LVMH's leadership. A product of Paris's elite educational institutions and the London School of Economics, Alexandra's blend of academic rigor and a laid-back demeanor mirrors the chic nonchalance of the fashion world he inhabits. Since striding into the executive vice presidency at Tiffany & Company in 2023, Alexandre has been the wind beneath the brand's wings, injecting a cocktail of technology and innovation into its veins. He's not just a suit, he's a digital maven, sculpting Group Arnaud's technological footprint with the precision of a master jeweler. Then there's Frederick, born in 1995, a young titan at the helm of Tag Heuer. With his roots entrenched in France's creme de la creme of educational institutions, Frederick's ascent to CEO is akin to a meticulously planned moon landing, precise, ambitious, and spectacularly successful. Under his stewardship, Tag Heuer has not just ticked along, it has boomed with some watch models becoming as coveted as a golden ticket to Willy Wonka's factory. Not to be overshadowed, Jean Arnaud, the family's dark horse, leads with a dual master's degree in financial mathematics and mechanical engineering. At Louis Vuitton, he's not just a director, he's a maestro of watches development and marketing, weaving strategy, innovation and new product launches into a symphony of success.